Afternoon, everybody. It's nice to see you all. For those of you who traveled to New York, welcome back. For those of you who didn't, it's nice to see you. Uh, let me do um, a quick thing at the top on an issue that I know that you're very interested in, uh, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, there's some recent data that I think merits some attention, and so to the extent that I can lend some attention toward it, uh, I'll begin the briefing by discussing it. Uh, the first is uh, today's GDP report shows that health care prices, the costs that matter the most to consumers, continue to grow uh, at historically slow rates. Prices of health care services increased at a rate of only 1.8 percent annually in the second quarter of 2014. Uh, this, is a, this slow rate follows four years in which we have seen the slowest growth in the prices of health care goods and services in nearly the last 50 years. Uh, you'll recall that one of the principal goals of the Affordable Care Act was to bend the cost curve uh, as it relates to uh, health care. Uh, and there is early evidence to indicate that um, there's very strong success in doing that. The second thing is, also this week, uh, HHS released a report showing that thanks to the Affordable Care Act, hospitals will save $5.7 billion just this year, that's billion with a B, uh, because of fewer unpaid bills, uh, with about 74 percent of the total savings going to states that have smartly expanded Medicaid. Uh, so that is, again, an uh, additional data point as it relates to cost savings, again, thanks to the Affordable Care Act. Uh, the third one, I know it seems like there are a lot of reports this week. Uh, the third report uh, released this week shows that consumers will have even greater competition and choice in the health insurance marketplace next year, with 77 new health insurers participating uh, in uh, the marketplace in 2015. That's a 25 percent increase. Uh, and again, this is another underlying principle of the Affordable Care Act, uh, getting uh, uh, expanding choices that are available to consumers uh, and using competition in the marketplace to drive down costs. So we certainly would welcomed uh, that news. Uh, and then finally, uh, a recent survey shows that the average premium for employer-provided family health care coverage only went up 3 percent this year. Uh, that's tied for the lowest increase since they began conducting this survey back in 1999. Uh, so again, uh, this is for individuals who uh, largely already had health insurance when the Affordable Care Act was passed, uh, but yet it has, uh, this law has had an effect of restraining growth uh, in their costs as well. Uh, this is also a cost that is borne by businesses. Uh, another thing that we saw a lot in advance of the Affordable Care Act were businesses that sought to provide health care benefits to their employers and to their employees, uh, but were either reluctant to do so or unable to do so because of the uh, fast growing costs. Uh, but again, thanks to the Affordable Care Act, that cost was lower than it's ever been last year. Uh, so, uh, with all of that, we certainly can provide you some additional information about each of these individual reports uh, and the impact that it's having. Uh, on families and businesses all across the country. Uh, just follow up and let me know if you would like. So with that long wind up, Nedra, let's uh, kick off this Friday's briefing. Great. Thanks, Josh. Um, lawmakers across Europe are voting to um, join the airstrike campaign against the Islamic State. Um, why is it that a place like Britain, where that was a fair contention since you last year, can, can get support from lawmakers, and yet that's not happening here in the United States. Does that make anyone here think that maybe that's the way that it should be done with lawmaker support? Well, uh, let me start by saying that we certainly welcome the uh, recent vote that occurred in the uh, British Parliament, uh, indicating their strong support for the plan that the President has put forward for dealing with the threat that's posed by ISIL. Uh, the uh, United States and the United Kingdom have a special relationship. And we are pleased uh, to see the strong support from members of parliament uh, for uh, members of the British military uh, working alongside uh, U.S. servicemen and women uh, in pursuit of this goal that benefits countries uh, all around the globe, including the United States and the U.K. Uh, also this week, we uh, saw that the parliament of Belgium uh, approved sending six F-16s uh, to join the growing international coalition. Uh, again, that is, a, that is another welcome development uh, and one that is indicative of uh, the growing support that we're seeing across uh, the globe for this international coalition that the President had vowed to build and lead. Uh, there are other countries that made important announcements in recent days. Uh, just earlier today, I believe it was just today, we saw that Denmark uh, indicated that their willingness to contribute uh, fighter jets to participate in airstrikes against ISIL in Iraq. Uh, that follows upon uh, the announcements of, of, um, of Denmark 
uh, to do the same thing, uh, to dedicate fighter jets to this uh, effort. Uh, we've already seen um, the French take airstrikes against ISIL in Iraq. So there's a strong growing coalition among our European allies and partners for this effort uh, that, is, uh, that builds upon the partnership uh, that the United States has already worked to build with uh, Muslim countries in the region uh, who worked alongside uh, American pilots to hit targets uh, in Syria earlier this week. So uh, there is a broad uh, effort underway uh, to build this international coalition, uh, and we are pleased with the pace of this coalition's growth, and we're pleased uh, with the strong ties between uh, the United States or among the United States and countries around the world as we confront this threat. But that they are having support for that coalition in Europe among lawmakers. Does that make anyone here at the White House look at that and say, you know, we would like to have that tour, that's the way that it should be done? Well, we certainly welcome uh, any indication from Congress of their support for the strategy that the President has put in place. Uh, I talked just last week or the week before, I've lost track, uh, about uh, Congress taking the step to give the administration the needed authority to ramp up our training and assistance program to Syrian opposition fighters. Uh, that was a pretty clear indication of Democrats and Republicans in Congress being willing to put aside their partisan labels and focus on the policy that they believe was in the best interest of American national security. So we certainly welcome that step, and that was a clear sign of support from a majority of Democrats and Republicans in both houses of Congress. Um, but if there are additional steps that Congress chooses to take to indicate their support for the President's strategy, we would welcome it. Um. Following up on the Attorney General's resignation yesterday, I know you said um, on the plane that you didn't have an update on timing, but you know, since then, some, including Ted Cruz, have said that the President <coughs> shouldn't make this nomination until a new Senate is in place. Um, does he think that's too long to wait, and does he intend to, to make the nomination this year? Uh, I don't have an update for you in terms of timing. The President will uh, obviously consider uh, a range of candidates and will put forward the, the individual he believes uh, is best positioned to lead the department. Uh, I'm, I feel confident in predicting for you now, without knowing who that candidate is, that that is somebody who will have the kinds of skills and credentials that will merit uh, a prompt uh, and bipartisan confirmation vote. Uh, that's certainly what we would uh, anticipate will happen. Uh, but in terms of timing, I don't have an update at this point. Not whether it will be this year or you'll wait for the new Senate. You haven't made a decision on that yet. Um, well, I, I don't know if a decision has been made. We certainly, I don't have one to announce from here. Uh, since you brought it up, I guess it is worth looking at some of the uh, uh, recent occasions in which Congress has considered uh, nominees in this context. Uh, many of you will recall that in the lead up to the 2006 election, uh, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld announced his uh, resignation. Uh, and it was the day after the election in 2006, the day after the midterm elections. Uh, that President Bush nominated uh, Bob Gates to be the Secretary of Defense. Now, you'll recall the dynamic that was at, at play. There was a Republican majority in the United States Senate. There uh, was an election, a midterm election, uh, that resulted in a change in power from a Republican majority to a Democratic majority. After that election occurred, and after it became clear that Democrats were going to take power in the United States Senate, uh, the Republican president put forward a nominee, uh, and with the strong support of the Republican leader of the Senate, Mitch McConnell, uh, indicated that that nominee should be confirmed in the lame duck period, that they should, not allow, they should not wait until after the first of the year. They should not allow the, the bipartisan, or they, they should not allow the new senators uh, in the Senate to uh, evaluate the nominee, but that this nominee should get a prompt vote. Uh, and in less than a month, December 6th, uh, Secretary Gates was confirmed to his post with strong bipartisan support. So there is a precedent for uh, presidents uh, making uh, important cabinet nominations uh, and counting on Congress to confirm them promptly, uh, even in the context of a lame duck session if necessary. Uh, the other relevant uh, analogy here I think also applies to Mr. Holder's predecessor, uh, Attorney General Mukasey. Uh, he was not uh, appointed in the context of a midterm election, but he was nominated for his job on September 17, 2007. And he was confirmed by the United States Senate in bipartisan fashion, again, by a 
um, a vote of a Senate that was led by the opposition party uh, within seven weeks. He was confirmed on November 8th, 2007. The other thing I think that's notable about Mr. Mukasey, aside from the fact that he got bipartisan support, uh, is that he was somebody who had been a federal judge and served with distinction in that role. Uh, and he was confirmed by the Senate in 1988. Uh, so it had been nearly 20 years before uh, his candidacy um, had been considered by the United States Senate for any sort of position. Uh, and yet within seven weeks, he was uh, given a hearing uh, and an up or down vote. Uh, and was eventually confirmed with bipartisan support. So there is a pretty clear precedent for uh, attorneys general uh, and for other prominent cabinet officials to go through the process of being nominated and confirmed uh, quickly uh, and with bipartisan support. So again, that is without uh, announcing any sort of decisions that have been made internally about timelines. Uh, but I guess the point I'm trying to make is that either way, uh, whether or not a nominee is uh, would need to be confirmed in the lame duck session uh, or would need to be confirmed by, um, by a new Senate, uh, that in either case, we would anticipate that the Senate would act promptly and in bipartisan fashion. You just happen to have those handy the, the information. <laughs> Mark, you counted me to show up to these briefings prepared. So at well least done. in this one case, uh, I was able to do so. So we'll see how the re we're, we're still on the first question. So who knows what could happen from here. Roberta. I just want to go back to airstrikes for a second. On um, the U.S. airstrikes, um, there have been strikes on Islamic State targets and Khorasan targets. And I'm wondering whether strikes on other al-Qaeda-linked groups like al Nusra have been ruled out, or are those possible to, or other types of extremist targets possible? Well, I uh, have worked hard uh, in answering these kinds of questions over the last few weeks to be as candid and transparent as possible while also protecting the need to act strategically. Uh, and that has often meant not previewing uh, in much detail uh, anticipated military actions. So uh, with that need for discretion in mind, let me just say generally uh, that the President has made clear that as a core principle uh, that he is willing and able to order military action where required to deny a safe haven to those individuals and organizations that are seeking to do harm to the United States uh, or our homeland. Uh, and that applies to uh, the wide array of extremist threats that are currently emanating from Syria at this point. Okay. Um, since our last briefing on Monday, um, new fences have gone up around the fence outside. And I'm just wondering what stage the Secret Service review is at, about what went wrong a week ago, and how to prevent other security incidents here. Well, I can tell you that that review is well underway. It was uh, action on that review began on the night of the incident one week ago today. So I can tell you that, the, that they have been making progress on that review. For a more detailed status update, I'd refer you to the, sec to the Secret Service who's conducting that uh, review right now. The White House have a timeline from when it will get the results of this review, which I'm sure the White House cares about very much? Uh, the White House does uh, care about the review that's being conducted by the Secret Service. Uh, I can tell you that the President uh, uh, was briefed uh, just last night by the Director of the Secret Service, uh, Julie Pearson, uh, where she was able to give him an update uh, of their review uh, and, um, uh, and their sort of initial assessment uh, of what occurred last week. Uh, but in terms of the timing of that review, um, I don't have an update. And what was his reaction to what she had to say to him? Well, I can tell you that the, that the President, uh, as he has since he took office, uh, has full confidence uh, in the ability of the Secret Service, including the leadership of the Secret Service, uh, to perform their very important job of protecting him and his family and the White House more generally. Uh, he recognizes that they have to balance some competing interests, the need to preserve uh, public access to the White House, to ensure that it retains uh, the image as the people house, as the people's house, uh, but also to ensure that uh, the people who work here on a daily basis, uh, from all of you, uh, to members of the White House staff, to the President, can do their job here safely. So there are a lot of competing interests, and the President has full confidence in the ability of the men and women of the Secret Service, including uh, those in leadership positions like the Director, uh, to perform their responsibilities uh, effectively and professionally. Okay. Oh, Move right Go ahead, Mark. Um, <laughs> was Julia Pearson here at the White House? Uh, she was, yes. Uh, did Mrs. Obama take part in that briefing? 
Uh, I, d I don't know, to be honest with you. You can check with the First Lady's office on that. I don't believe that she did, but check with them to confirm that. In the Oval Office, was it? That's where it took place, yes. About what time? Uh, it was after the President returned from New York. I don't know exactly when, so it would have been late in the afternoon, early evening. Thanks. Okay. Justin. Um, I wanted to ask first about the replacement for Attorney General Holder. Um, okay. Some of the high-profile names that have certainly been kind of flooding around, whether it was Deval Patrick or Kamala Harris or Senator Whitehouse, all said that they weren't interested in, in the position. And so I'm wondering if that's a reflection of a struggle that you guys are facing with filling this position at the end of the last two years of the presidency, or if there's any concern within the White House that you'll be able to find a top-tier candidate to kind of replace Sarah Calder. I have no concerns about that whatsoever. I'm confident that the individual that the president nominates will have all of the skills and experience necessary uh, to carry out the functions of the nation's top law enforcement official uh, very effectively. And then uh, on the Secret Service review, I'm wondering, especially as it pertains to the potential of making permanent the fence outside the White House or the additional fence. Is that a decision that the President will make after getting the results of the review, or is that a decision that the Secret Service would make on their own and then tell the President about? Well, as Roberta, or as Roberta alluded to, I, I would anticipate and expect that the White House, including the President, will review uh, the results of the, the reforms that the Secret Service is considering in this case. Um, I would expect that the President uh, and other members of the, of the White House will uh, grant significant discretion to the law enforcement professionals who are responsible for conducting the review but are also responsible for uh, protecting the White House. So uh, yes, the White House will uh, be aware of those decisions as they're being made, but ultimately uh, those are uh, important law enforcement uh, decisions and assessments. I, I guess I should say, let me just say it this way. Uh, those are the kinds of conclusions that law enforcement should draw, uh, and I'm confident that the White House will have uh, some input into those uh, as they relate to balancing the competing priorities here at the White House. So again, the White House is the people's house. Thousands of tourists tour the White House on a daily basis. There are hundreds of us who work here on a regular basis. Uh, there's also the, uh, a priority placed on protecting uh, the White House and the first family. So there are, pe there are competing interests here. Uh, the President does have confidence in the Secret Service to make the kinds of assessments uh, about how to balance those competing interests. Uh, and, uh, you know, the White House will be aware uh, and a part of those decisions. One, one of those competing interests is uh, D.C. residents. We've heard Eleanor Holmes Norton uh, ask to meet with the Secret Service or the administration on whatever would happen that would affect D.C. residents. And obviously this has been kind of an issue that's been uh, a hot button issue in D.C. politics for the last decade or so. And so I'm wondering if part of the review process, whether within the White House or at the Secret Service, will include soliciting uh, feedback or, or having a discussion with D.C. local leaders? Well, again, for, the, for questions about the review and refer to the Secret Service, I, I do feel confident saying from here that the review will consider the impact that any changes would have on all of the various stakeholders that are involved here, and I, that certainly would include uh, residents of the District of Columbia. Uh, but again, there are a lot of, of priorities uh, inequities that have to be balanced here, uh, and the President uh, and the White House staff have, the f have full confidence in the ability uh, of the Secret Service to make those decisions. Okay, Josh. move around a little bit. ML. Oh, thank you, Josh. Yesterday, President and Vice President Biden talked with President Turkey uh, to discuss the threat of terrorist groups and a Syrian crisis. During those conversations, I assume U.S. is taking uh, asking Turkey to take concrete steps to fight against ISIL. But some Turkish officials said during those conversations, Turkish uh, president set three preconditions jo for joining coalition militarily. One is first to establish no fly zone over Syria. Second is, which is very difficult uh, task for US, that US must make removing Assad as a high as, as a high priority as fighting ISIL. Third is U.S. must show full support to moderate Syrian opposition. So it seems to me now, uh, ball is in U.S. court. What is your view on these uh, preconditions? Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing that's uh, I think is important uh, is to uh, acknowledge that what the United States is doing is building a broader international coalition. Uh, so you have talked about uh, steps that you that the that the 
government of Turkey has indicated they would like to see. Uh, several of those things are, um, you know, include mitigating the threat to ISIL, uh, or mitigating the ISIL threat to countries in the region. Uh, they also include uh, trying to meet the humanitarian needs of those individuals inside Syria that have been displaced to other countries in the region. Turkey has certainly borne uh, a pretty significant weight uh, when it comes to trying to meet the basic humanitarian needs of those individuals in Syria who fled to Turkey uh, ahead of violence uh, in their communities back home. So uh, it is clear that the incentives and interests of the people of Turkey uh, are pretty closely aligned with the incentives uh, of the United States and other members of the coalition uh, that has been formed to counter the threat from ISIL. The, uh, the President had the opportunity to speak with, uh, President, um, with President Erdogan yesterday prior to his meeting with uh, Vice President Biden. Uh, so there has been, there is an open line of communication between senior government officials here in the United States uh, and the leadership of Turkey. Uh, we've also talked about how it is not in the interest of any country in the region, particularly Turkey, uh, for there to be the kind of instability and violence that ISIL is uh, promoting right on Turkey's doorstep. Uh, that, is, uh, that poses a significant threat to the stability of, of Turkey. I know that's something that President Erdogan himself has indicated he's concerned about. Uh, and that's precisely why the President, um, the, because the President shares his concerns, uh, the President is building this broader international coalition to uh, degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. Uh, we would anticipate uh, that we will get cooperation from Turkey uh, because, uh, not if you will as a favor necessarily to the United States, uh, but because it is so clearly in Turkey's national security interest for them to be part of this broader coalition uh, to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. So the lines of communication between the United States and other coalition members with Turkey will remain open. Uh, we value the strong working relationship uh, that we have uh, with President Erdogan and other members of the government there in Turkey. Uh, and we would anticipate that that uh, open dialogue uh, and strong working relationship uh, will continue even as we work to meet the ISIL threat. Okay, John. Just a couple of quick ones. First, uh, you have a private dinner with the Prime Minister of India here on Monday, and he's going to be fasting. I'm wondering, how does the White House hold a dinner for somebody who is fasting? What was the plan? Well, uh, John, we obviously tried to meet the uh, to be respectful of the needs of uh, uh, of all of the high-profile visitors that come to the White House, and to be respectful of their um, observances. Uh, it's my understanding that we're talking about a, a working dinner with um, a substantial number of people around the table. Uh, if you know, Prime Minister Modi or, uh, or or other members who are participating in that uh, working dinner choose not to eat uh, based on their own religious or cultural observance. Uh, then we'll certainly work to accommodate uh, their needs as best we can. So there will be food at the table, but uh, he just won't partake, basically. Well, I, I mean, I, I think that he has indicated that is what his plan is, uh, but I, I'll let his spokesman speak for him. Okay. Um, and um, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, first of all, going back to the UN, was there any contact at all with the President and the Iranian delegation? Um, no, I'm not aware of any contact that the President personally had with the Iranian delegation. You will recall, or I think you're aware that there were a number of meetings between American officials uh, and uh, uh, members of the Iranian delegation going all the way up to Secretary of State John Kerry uh, and his counterpart, Foreign Minister Zarif. Uh, that there were conversations that they had principally focused on uh, the P5 plus one negotiations. Uh, there were some conversations on the side uh, about some other issues related to uh, this broader international coalition against ISIL. Uh, but there was no, uh, there was no specific presidential uh, communication that I'm aware of. Uh, and there, there's some reporting that the, uh, the, the, the White House, the administration, is considering a new approach with the nuclear talks that would basically allow the Iranians to keep about half of the centrifuges they have um, and then more dramatically reduce their stockpile uh, of, of, of nuclear fuel that they have. So is, there, is there anything to these reports that you would actually strike a deal with the Iranians with the, the, the keep half of their uh, centrifuges? Uh, I won't be in a position to explain what our current negotiating position is or um, to try to describe or characterize the accuracy of reports that are attempting to describe our current negotiating position. Uh, this is a, uh, these are conversations that have been going on for quite some time. Uh, this is uh, the United States acting in concert with our P5 plus one 
partners to reach an agreement with Iran that would mitigate the broader international community's concern about Iran's nuclear program. Uh, and uh, we do believe that it is a, uh, it's critically important uh, for Iran in a verifiable, demonstrable way to come into compliance with uh, generally accepted uh, international standards as it relates to their nuclear program, to, uh, to essentially ensure, uh, again, in a verifiable, transparent way, that their nuclear program exists solely for uh, peaceful purposes. Uh, and that is, um, that, is a, that is a priority. Uh, that is something that the Iranian regime says that they aim to do. Um, but again, these are very difficult negotiations. And uh, as much as I would like to, John, I'm not going to be in a position to negotiate a nuclear agreement with Iran, uh, just right between here. you and me. But, but we, we might have more success. We probably would. Uh, um, but, um, but, but that, that's them. They're hard at work uh, behind closed doors. Uh, the deadline is November. Uh, obviously, we would had a previous deadline of June that was extended. Is this November deadline a real deadline, or is the White House open to extending it again? Well, uh, at this point, the negotiations are ongoing. So I, I wouldn't want to get ahead of those negotiations by signaling a willingness to extend the deadline. Um, the previous deadline was real. As after in, the, uh, in the aftermath of the previous deadline, you'll recall that a, that a subsequent agreement was reached that actually prompted Iran uh, to further roll back uh, their nuclear program. So this is not a situation where the United States is uh, just running out the clock uh, in a way that gives cover to Iran to make advances to their nuclear program. That was, um, that was evident in, um, uh, in, uh, in earlier rounds of negotiations. There was concern that Iran would just use these negotiations as cover to make additional progress on their nuclear program. Uh, the opposite is actually taking place here. As these conversations continue, uh, nucle Iran's nuclear program is further rolled back. Um, but you know, th these, uh, these negotiations continue, uh, and there are uh, senior officials uh, in the administration who are uh, very hard at work on this uh, important national security priority. Okay, then I've got one other, which is uh, in, in light of now we all know about this group, Khorasan, obviously the, uh, the United States has, has bombed, it is made up in part by um, Al Qaeda, members of Al Qaeda who came from, uh, from Afghanistan, Pakistan. Uh, I'm wondering that in light of this, you know, major military operation against the group that was uh, planning an imminent attack uh, on the United States. Is, is, it, is it time to kind of revise and extend what the White House has said over and over again by claiming that core al-Qaeda has been decimated? Uh, was it, is it clear now that that was simply an incorrect statement? No, it continues to be clear to this day that core al-Qaeda has been decimated. But we just that had the, to in bomb a, a group that, that represents, you know, remnants of al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and Pakistan that Pose such a threat that we had to do a major military operation to uh, to hit them in right. Syria. Well, I think one thing that should be clear is that uh, these individuals and this organization in Pakistan and Afghanistan was so decimated that they had to flee to another country to try to find another safe haven to try to get into a position where they could carry out attacks against the West. That is, in, that's an indication of the constant pressure that they're under right now. Uh, it also is an indication that the United States con needs to continue to be and are, is continuing to be uh, vigilant about the threat that is posed by remnants of al-Qaeda, that there are affiliates around the globe that do continue to pose a threat to Western interests. Uh, and whether it's Somalia or Yemen uh, or, yes, even in Syria, the administration will put in place a counterterrorism strategy uh, to deny them a safe haven, to mitigate the threat that they pose, uh, and where necessary, use military force uh, to uh, degrade their ability to strike the West uh, or to strike the U.S. homeland. Uh, so we remain vigilant, uh, but there's no, no denying the significant success that we have had uh, in decimating and destroying core al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and Pakistan. But you were still able to pose a threat and plan an imminent attack that you were so concerned about that you've launched a military campaign against well, them. How can you call that decimated? I mean, the fact that they moved to Syria, where they had more access to more resources and actually were closer, uh, I mean, I, I, I don't understand how we can say this group's been decimated. Uh, because we be, in a military campaign. because what's clear, because of the bravery of uh, our American uh, military personnel, the, the courage of our uh, intelligence officials, and the effective work of our diplomats, uh, that network that previously was entrenched uh, in the border region between Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, and was so entrenched there that they could launch a worldwide conspiracy that allowed them to conduct a large-scale attack on the American homeland, no longer exists. That network is that network. That They're network closer. is gone. Uh, they what, what they have done, uh, like other uh, Al Qaeda affiliates, is fled to other places, hoping to hide from the United States because of the pressure that they're under, uh, and try to organize 
uh, and plot uh, against Western interests and possibly the Western homeland. We, we need to be uh, vigilant uh, against these threats, and we continue to be. But there's no denying that the network that, that existed before 9-11 has been decimated and destroyed. Jim. Uh, to follow up on Coruscant, why is it that the American people are just learning about this group now? Uh, when we woke up Tuesday morning to find out about these airstrikes on that group, uh, a lot of Americans had never even heard of this group before. Uh, should this administration have been warning the public, uh, talking about this group uh, in more detail prior to the strikes occurring? Uh, well, Jim, the, uh, our intelligence uh, services and our national security officials uh, have been closely watching the activities of this particular organization uh, for quite a while now. Uh, and uh, in order to do that effectively, uh, it does require uh, us to be less than transparent uh, in terms of the activities that we are engaged in to mitigate the threat that they pose. Uh, and um, you know, what we have done since then, since this group has been identified, uh, is to try to communicate as clearly as we can uh, why military action was necessary. Uh, the military operation that was conducted earlier this week uh, is still uh, being reviewed in terms of what impact uh, it had. The early indications are that the uh, operation was effective and impactful, uh, but we, uh, we, and by we I mean the Department of Defense, is still conducting an assessment uh, of, of um, what the results were from the strike. And uh, the FBI director said yesterday that Coruscant is at the top of the list of threats uh, that he's concerned about. Does the President also share that view? Uh, the President is concerned about the threat uh, that is emanating from extremist groups in the region, uh, including in Syria and including the Khorasan group. Uh, but the fact is there are al-Qaeda affiliates around the globe uh, that we uh, are remain vigilant about. Uh, and that means that we are uh, focused on implementing a counterterrorism strategy that applies continual pressure to them uh, and mitigates the threat that they can pose uh, to the United States, our interests in our homeland. And on Prime Minister Abani, yesterday he told a group of reporters about this uh, alleged subway plot uh, in the U.S. and in France, and it seemed as if later in the day the Iraqis were sort of walking back those comments. What's the latest assessment? Uh, did the Iraqi Prime Minister just botch that one? What happened there? <laughs> well, again, you'd have to uh, speak to the spokesperson for the uh, Iraqi Prime Minister in terms of what he actually meant. Uh, you saw from State Department officials that they followed up with their Iraqi, with their Iraqi counterparts uh, and uh, determined that what Prime Minister Abadi was referring to is a threat uh, that is posed by foreign terrorist fighters. We've talked about that uh, on a number of occasions in this room, that there are individuals uh, in the West and from countries around the world uh, who have traveled to the region to take up arms alongside ISIL. Uh, and the concern is that they could use their training and equipment and their willingness to die for their cause uh, to return home and launch violent attacks. Um, on their own homeland, wherever they're from. Uh, some of those individuals are from the United States. They seem to be speaking and about something specific, and it really right. sort of launched this administration, uh, parts of the administration, into coming out and saying, you know, we've looked at this, we've assessed this, the mayor of New York had to come out. I mean, it really sort of had everybody on edge there for several hours yesterday, including a lot of New Yorkers. Well, we, uh, we, we have a, we value the strong working relationship that we have uh, with Prime Minister Abadi and his government. Uh, we're obviously working very closely with them to, to uh, to counter ISIL both on the ground uh, in Iraq, but also to counter the broader threat that they pose to Western interests. Uh, so that is uh, what that means, because we value that relationship and we have confidence in that relationship, it means that we, are, we have open lines of communication. Uh, and as they assess threats, we want to be in close touch with them about that. That's exactly what occurred yesterday. Uh, and that is what allowed us to clarify that, um, that apparently Prime Minister Abadi was not referring to a specific threat, was, but was referring more broadly uh, to the threat that is posed by foreign terrorist fighters that are fighting alongside ISIL uh, in, the, in his country and in Syria. Can I just ask you very quickly about the President's speech to the United Nations? Sure. Uh, it seemed as if, you know, the, the talk about, uh, you know, the only language that these terrorists understand is force and, uh, you know, any of these fighters better clear out the, the battlefield. I mean, this, this seemed to be a departure for the President in terms of the toughness that he, he put into this speech. And I'm just wondering, has he had a moment of clarity about all of this, uh, why, has it, why has he sort of left maybe more of these mixed messages behind that we've heard from him in recent weeks about yeah. maybe not having a strategy and managing versus degrading and destroying? And I know you may 
challenge some of those assertions that I just made there in that yeah. question, but uh, <laughs> but but it, it did seem it, it did seem you know not not too unreasonable for the Economist to put the president in George W. Bush's flight suit on the cover of their magazine yeah. this week. Well, uh, Jim, you're right. I strongly disagree with with that assessment. Assessment. You you are. Um, I tried. <laughs> you did. You did, and you are you're you're more than entitled to your opinion. You're somebody who's been who's been following this. Rational point of view, though, that people have been expressing this week, that he just sort of that there, you know, there was a different President Obama at the United Nations on Wednesday. Is that a fair or unfair statement? Uh, I think it's an unfair statement because I do think that a a, a careful scrutiny of the president's record uh, indicates that he is somebody who has been very strong uh, about the need to act decisively to counter threats from extremist groups emanating from anywhere in the world. Uh, this goes all the way back to a speech that the President delivered on August 1st, 2007. So this is even before he won the Democratic nomination. Uh, and in that speech, the President signaled his willingness to go into Pakistan if necessary, without the permission of that government, uh, to get Osama bin Laden if he thought he could do it. Uh, that was, at the time, regarded as a very bold and provocative statement. Uh, it was. Uh, and it was a signal of how determined uh, this President at that point would be, and that how this president has been, uh, in terms of taking the force, using the force that's necessary to protect the American people and the American homeland uh, and our interests around the globe. Uh, the president followed through uh, on that promise to go after Osama bin Laden where necessary. Uh, the uh, president uh, has ordered counterterrorism missions in locations around the globe uh, where we have succeeded in working with our local partners. Uh, to mitigate the threat that's posed by organizations like AQAP, like Al-Shabaab. Uh, you recall that just a couple of weeks ago, as a result of military strike in Somalia, uh, the uh, leader of Al-Shabaab was killed. Uh, in just the last month or so, as a result of actions ordered by uh, this commander-in-chief, uh, more than 170 military airstrikes have been conducted against ISIL by American military uh, aircraft uh, in Iraq alone. So uh, I think there's a variety of evidence to indicate that the President uh, since he first arrived on the national stage, has demonstrated not just an openness to, but a commitment to acting decisively and forcefully to protect American interests all around the world. Okay. Yes, Bill. How would you square that with the widespread assumption that the president has been very accommodating, has sought to play down American exceptionalism, beginning with his Cairo speech in 2009, where he reached out and embraced the rest of the world and seemed to play down the more militaristic aspects of the American experience in the previous administration. That's the impression that we're talking about here. I don't think that's an impression that's rooted in the facts. I'll just be blunt about it. I, I think that what the President has done time and time again is signaled a willingness to engage with the international community, to try to find those situations in which our interests align, uh, and to partner closely with them to advance our mutual interests. At the same time, the President is not willing to do that to the exclusion of American interests. Where necessary, he's uh, willing to act unilaterally and forcefully uh, to protect the American people. He believes, however, that that, that, that use of force can be more effective uh, if it is done alongside partners all around the globe. And that's what we've done in places like Yemen and Somalia to mitigate the threats from extremist organizations in those countries. But the best example is the coalition that's being built right now, yeah, where we have- was that He hasn't done that until now. Well, again, uh, the situations that I cited uh, here with Jim uh, are indications that the President has been willing to decide uh, to take forceful action where necessary to protect the American people and American interests. And when it, whether it's killing Osama bin Laden uh, or killing the leader of, uh, of al-Shabaab, uh, the United States is going to work either alone or in partnership with local forces to protect American interests. And the President has not um, done anything to indicate a uh, hesitation uh, to do exactly that. In fact, he has acted very forcefully, sometimes uh, in a way that has prompted criticism uh, from even members of his own party uh, because of his willingness to uh, order bold action to protect uh, the American people. Uh, but that's not something the President apologizes for. You know, to what do you mean exactly when you say that uh, the power of Khorasan and Al-Qaeda has been decimated? Are you literally saying we've taken out every tenth man? Uh, what I'm suggesting is that the network that previously existed between Afghanistan and Pakistan, this is a network that was so potent uh, and so deeply entrenched that they could carry out a global conspiracy that took years to enact 
uh, that allowed them to strike the U.S. homeland in a catastrophic way that caused thousands of Americans to lose their lives on a, on a very tragic day. Uh, as a result, uh, that as a result of this president's policies, uh, as a result primarily of the courageous service of our men and women in uniform uh, and the dedication of our intelligence professional, professionals, that network has been decimated. Now, there continues to be a threat from al Qaeda affiliates and other extremists around the globe, but the president's just going, going to be just as determined uh, and just as persistent uh, in countering uh, and rooting out that threat as well. How many Khorasan fighters are left? Uh, I don't have a, a detailed intelligence assessment uh, on the Khorasan. There's a out there that it's only a handful, actually. Well, again, I, I, I don't have uh, an intelligence assessment on the Khorasan group to share from here. But you can check with the intelligence community. They may be able to provide you a. Well, a better understanding than I have. Well, I, I, I think for uh, I think for obvious reasons that I uh, that I alluded to uh, with Jim, they there are uh, certain aspects of this that prevent them from being fully transparent. But uh, it's possible they may be able to at least guide you in the direction of uh, uh, gaining a better understanding of uh, of that group. So yes, Ed. In answer to those questions, though, in terms of decisive action by the president, how can you cite as a success Yemen when the country is falling apart? Because, Ed, what we have seen is we have seen the uh, effective deployment of a counterterrorism strategy that involves building up the capacity of local forces, uh, on occasion backed by American military forces, uh, to counter extremist threats that are emanating from that country. So if it's been so successful, why are we pulling our embassy personnel out of there? Uh, Ed, what we have been focused on is mitigating the threat from extremists uh, and of denying them the kind of safe haven that would allow them to plot. Safe haven because we're pulling out. We have to get our people out of there. Ed, what we have seen in Yemen is the effective deployment of a counterterrorism strategy to put continual pressure on extremist groups that seek to do harm to the United States. And what so that much has pressure, done, why are we leaving? What that has done is it has prevented those extremist groups from being able to plot and plan and carry out successfully. Uh, attacks against uh, the U.S. homeland. That requires vigilance. Uh, if we take a day off, they can build up capacity in such a way that could be very dangerous uh, to the U.S. or our interests around the globe. So I don't want to signal to you that this is a, a mission that has been accomplished, uh, but it has been a strategy effectively uh, implemented uh, in a way that has mitigated the threat from extremist organizations that are dangerous uh, and that seek to do harm to the United States. You just used the mission accomplished uh, phrase from the Bush administration in the Economist cover. It was mentioned they have the president in a flight suit and they change it to mission relaunched. How, how do you respond to that? You've, you've gotten a couple of different versions of this, but yes. that basically the president just sort of relaunched the Bush war on terror. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start by saying I didn't realize there were so many economist readers in this room, so. That's kind of let, a provocative let me, cover. Let me, just the cover. Just the cover. Just the cover. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Just I see. Cover. I see. So, I can give you details of the story. But I see. So unlike some of the other magazines, you, you read it for the pictures as opposed to the articles. Uh, talking about me. No, no. no. I you couldn't resist that. So I couldn't resist that one. Uh, but you asked a serious question. I'm going to stop joking around now. The, um, what is clear, uh, based on the strategy that the President has laid out, uh, what he's pursuing is a strategy that's very different than the strategy that was pursued by the previous administration. Uh, the previous administration undertook an effort to deploy more than 100,000 uh, American military personnel to Iraq to occupy uh, that land uh, and to try to put in place uh, a democracy in Iraq. Our military men and women um, served this country bravely uh, in Iraq. Uh, many of them paid a significant sacrifice for doing so. Uh, it did create an opportunity for the Iraqi people to try to uh, seize uh, some stability uh, and greater control over their country. But what we found uh, is that the Iraqi people did not succeed in taking advantage of that opportunity. Uh, and the conclusion that this president drew is that these kinds of fights, that securing the Iraqi countryside for the Iraqi people is not an effective strategy because it doesn't lead to an enduring solution. What we need instead is a strategy that puts the Iraqi people, the Iraqi government, and the Iraqi security forces on point for fighting for their own country. Uh, they can count on the support of the United States of America and a broader international coalition as they take the fight to ISIL. But ultimately, that is a, uh, that is a fight that, they, uh, that we cannot wage for them. We can support them, 
Uh, and that is what distinguishes the strategy that, that is being pursued by this administration from the strategy that was pursued by the previous one. Very last one on Holder. When you said at the top that the, the, you used the uh, example of Bob Gates after the 2006 midterms, I believe. That's right. My recollection is President Bush made the case that we were in the middle of two wars at that time. And so you had to move quickly on the defense sector. That would be another factor that you didn't mention about speed. And so I wonder if you'd acknowledge that, but also are, it, does the president, this president, make to, plan to make a case that the attorney general is in the middle of so much important work right now that you do have to move forward on it um, right after the midterms? Uh, I think I do feel confident that the president will make the case that the work of the, import, of the attorney general is so important uh, that the United States Senate should act promptly and in bipartisan fashion to confirm his nominee. Uh, I, that, is a, that is a case uh, that I think is easily made uh, by this president in the same way that it was made by uh, uh, not just his immediate predecessor, but by uh, many of his predecessors. Okay. Chris. Thanks, Josh. Uh, well, given the fact that uh, of everything that's been said over the last week about the threat posed by Khorasan and what has been said previously about how effective the administration felt the fight against al-Qaeda has been, can you sort of jive those two things? Can you give us an assessment of where the White House stands now on how, where they think the threat is by I, uh, both Al Qaeda and, and its, uh, its members that are still left? Uh, you mean specifically as it relates to the Khorasan group? Uh, I, I would say in general, what kind of threat does Al Qaeda pose? Because there has been um, an indication, especially in the post bin Laden era, that Al Qaeda did not pose a significant threat anymore. Well, I think, uh, Chris, the, the, it's important for people to un understand uh, this complicated situation. The threat that has been decimated uh, is the threat that was posed by core al-Qaeda. This is a network that was based uh, along the Afghan-Pakistan border. Uh, that threat has been decimated because that network in that region of the world uh, has been decimated. And again, that is a testament to the courage, skill, and professionalism uh, of our intelligence officials and the United States military. Uh, what continues to persist, however, is a threat that emanates from al-Qaeda affiliates uh, in countries around the globe, uh, that there are al-Qaeda affiliates that are active in Yemen. Uh, there's a threat that is posed by al-Qaeda al affiliates in Somalia. Uh, there, is, uh, there is an al-Qaeda uh, affiliate in North Africa, uh, AQIM. Uh, that is something that uh, we have been closely watching and that has been uh, effectively countered, uh, again, by the strategy that this uh, administration has put in place. Uh, there is also this threat that emanates from extremist groups uh, in Syria, most notably the, the Khorasan group. And what this indicates is it means that the, uh, while we have made tremendous gains uh, in terms of decimating core al-Qaeda, the threat from these other uh, affiliated organizations that have uh, spread out to other countries uh, is uh, significant, but it's very different. Uh, that when we're talking about, for example, uh, AQIM, we're not talking about a years in the making uh, global conspiracy uh, that would result in a catastrophic attack uh, on the homeland. The nature of the threat is different. Uh, one reason that the nature of that threat is different uh, is that previously, uh, core Al Qaeda in Afghanistan and Pakistan operated in a virtual safe haven, uh, that there was not a willingness or a capability by local governments to root them out. Uh, and that is why you have seen this administration implement a strategy that is focused on working with our international partners to support local governments and local forces to take the fight to these extremist groups in their own country. Uh, and by applying sustained pressure to these organizations, it's mitigated the threat that they pose to the West. It hasn't eliminated it yet. But in many of these situations, you have leaders of these organizations that are so concerned with their own safety that it's inhibiting their ability to threaten ours. Uh, and that's a core component of our strategy. And that is why um, the threat that we face now is different, uh, but it is one that we continue to be vigilant about. But equal? Well, I, I, again, the capabilities are quite different. The capability that core al-Qaeda, that the network of core al-Qaeda retained uh, in advance of 9-11 was dramatic. We're talking about a global conspiracy. We had individuals in multiple countries who were all closely linked. They were all funded, uh, and they spent years plotting this catastrophic attack on the U.S. homeland. Uh, that kind of freedom to uh, plan uh, and execute a large-scale plot uh, no longer exists. Uh, they pose a threat, and we are concerned about that, and we work every day to mitigate that threat, and we do so by working with our local partners uh, and by working with the international community. Uh, but the threat that they pose uh, is quite different. And can I make a dramatic 
turn and ask you if the president sure. saw or has commented on the final moments of the Yankees game yeah. last night and Derek Jeter. <laughs> uh, I did not talk to him about the uh, uh, the uh, the uh, final home game in uh, Mr. Jeter's illustrious career, but it certainly was a, a storybook ending to a remarkable career. So, even for a Royal State. Roger. Thank you. Uh, I want to switch topics to North Korea. Uh, the leader there, Kim Jong-un, has not been seen in public for about three weeks. Uh, North Korean television is saying he has some sort of discomfort. Um, have you heard any talk around the West Wing here? Uh, what's going on? Where is he? Is there some revolution going on? Uh, Roger, I'll have to admit, I've not seen those reports about uh, um, about Kim Jong Un's schedule, uh, but I'd refer you to the uh, the State Department, who may have some more information about his uh, comfort. Um, well, I, I actually would just recommend that you you contact the State Department. If I'm able to get something, I'll come back to you on it, though. Okay, uh, April. Josh, um, I want to talk. Um, get you to talk about the estimates of these airstrikes uh, by 2016. Uh, listening to the Pentagon briefing, the cost estimate was seven to ten million dollars a day, um, and hearing from Hank Johnson, Congressman Hank Johnson, who sits on the House Armed Services Committee, he says that um, it's not out of the realm of possibility that you could hit one, hundreds of millions of dollars with these airstrikes. Exactly what is the White House <coughs> estimate as the Department of Defense is looking for more money to fund this? Uh, April, the, the Department of Defense is the one that's responsible for carrying out these military operations, and they're in the best position to give you an assessment uh, of what the running total uh, is in terms of the costs that they're incurring as they carry them out. So as they brief you and, and the President and others here at the White House and, and tell you about the 43 airstrikes that we've conducted so far and the ones that they want to, uh, they hope to do in the future, they have not given you any kind of cost estimates as you look to possibly deal with the, the next budget year and things of that nature? I, I think they've, they've carried out uh, substantially more than just 43 airstrikes. I think they're up to 170 or so in Iraq. No, but they're talking about Syria. They were just talking about just now from the Pentagon. Okay. Um, I, I have not. I, I have. We're obviously aware that they have estimated that so far uh, the average cost of carrying out this mission has been about 7 to $10 million a day. Uh, that's that's based on their estimates. That's obviously a pretty significant uh, uh, gap, or at least window there, of, of, of an estimate. So uh, they're they're constantly refining and mindful of the need, uh, and certainly the commander in chief is mindful of the need that they have uh, to have the necessary resources to carry out this very important operation. So uh, we'll certainly make whatever decisions are necessary. We certainly are interested in working with Congress uh, to ensure that they have the necessary resources to fulfill this mission and carry it out successfully. Bearing the, the largest portion of the financial burden as it relates to airstrikes? Well, the United States, well, again, I, I'd refer you to the Department of Defense. It's my understanding that uh, the United States has taken more airstrikes uh, in Syria than any of the other partners. Um, I don't know, however, whether or not that, that constitutes a majority uh, of the airstrikes uh, in Syria. So I'd, re I'd encourage you to check with them on that. Okay. JC? Um, there's been reports that Russia has reached out to uh, Iraq saying initially that they would be helpful in supporting their fight against terror, especially ISIL. Considering how much is at stake for Mr. Putin and for Russia, especially in their borders, where they border Chechnya, where the, these insurgents are as well, might the President make another overture to, to Mr. Putin and get some kind of a firm commitment for his support as he has from the other leaders in Europe? Well, JC, we've seen public comments uh, from President Putin indicating his concern uh, about the threat that foreign fighters pose to Russia. Uh, there is uh, some uh, evidence to indicate that there are individuals who have traveled from Russia or uh, countries bordering Russia uh, that have traveled to f uh, take up arms alongside ISIL. Uh, and like the dozens of other countries around the globe, uh, they are concerned about the threat that is posed by those individuals returning uh, back home and uh, carrying out acts of violence back home. So. Uh, there is a clear vested interest that Russia has in mitigating this threat uh, and ultimately uh, 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 you know, supporting the, the broader uh, effort to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. Uh, earlier this week, the President convened a United Nations Security Council meeting uh, where they passed a resolution with uh, unanimous support uh, on the Security Council, including Russia, for putting in place 
um, uh, broad standards uh, across the globe to keep eyes on and mitigate the threat that's posed by foreign terrorist fighters. That's an indication that uh, Russia, at least in that instance, uh, is working cooperatively with the broader international community uh, to confront this threat. Uh, and that certainly is an indication that uh, despite uh, our differences with Russia as it relates to the situation in Ukraine, uh, that we do have the ability to cooperate with them in other areas of, of mutual interest. Uh, I read with interest today that uh, that American uh, astronaut was uh, sent into space uh, alongside two uh, Russian cosmonauts, uh, that they're staffing the International Space Station up there. And again, that's another piece of, uh, of evidence to indicate that, again, despite our differences, uh, there are opportunities where we can successfully collaborate uh, with Russia. Well, I wouldn't want to speculate about what sort of collaboration uh, uh, we might see. Jared. Josh, to Nedra's question, you said that you welcomed votes in allied democratic parliaments authorizing participation in the anti-ISIS effort. Does the president regret not asking Congress to stay or congressional leaderships to stay and take a vote or to change the AUMF status or in any way otherwise mirror the votes that we're now seeing in Europe? Uh, Jared, as we said on a number of occasions, the, the President does believe that he has the statutory legal authority that's necessary uh, to launch the military actions that he has already ordered. Uh, if, there, if members of Congress decide that they would like to um, pass additional legislation or, um, or some other way signal their support for the President's strategy, then we'd welcome them doing so. That, that uh, indication of support when se would send a very, very powerful message to the American people, to our allies, and even to our enemies, uh, that across party lines uh, and even across uh, branches of government, that the American people are united uh, in our determination to pursue a strategy that will degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. Do you think there's any reason that Congress didn't take those votes other than political or campaign uh, cycle considerations? Uh, I think you'd have to ask them uh, what sort of decisions they're making about their, uh, about what pieces of, uh, about what things to vote on and how to vote on them. And aside from that and the reason that the White House doesn't think it's necessary that our legislature make that vote, is there any reason the White House didn't ask for it? About why we didn't? Ask for, for any kind of uh, vote that would mirror what we're seeing now in Europe? Well, again, Jared, because the, because the President believes and because his, uh, his uh, national security team believes that he has all of the uh, statu statutory authority that's required uh, to order the military action that, that, uh, that's being carried out right now. Um, you know, we're, we're confident in the position that the President has. The, uh, but again, if Congress chooses to signal, uh, send a signal of uh, their support for what's taking place right now, we'd welcome them doing so. So it's nice that our allied democracies are doing this, but it's not necessary here. Well, certainly these, these, uh, these legislatures around the globe aren't, aren't taking votes related to the President's authority, if that's what you're asking. They obviously are making decisions about, the, uh, about their own country's resources and about their own country's involvement in this broader coalition. Uh, that said, we welcome the show of support that we're seeing from other countries uh, for the President's strategy uh, and for the broader coalition. Uh, and in the same way, we welcome uh, their uh, participation in this debate. We would. Uh, welcome additional signals from, from Congress for, uh, that support the President's position. So, Thanks, Kathleen, I'll give you the last one. Um, I have two, if I could. On, the uh, last two. Yeah, sorry. Um, now that there's an official President-elect in Afghanistan, maybe you've said this before, but how quickly do you expect him to sign the Status of Forces Agreement? Uh, I believe the uh, inauguration is taking place on Monday, and we would anticipate that he would sign the Bilateral Security Agreement promptly after that. I don't know exactly whether he said which day. Uh, but, uh, well, again, I, uh, it's, it's ironic that I speak for the President of the United States, but I've asked, been asked to speak on behalf of like three or four different world leaders uh, in the context of this news conference. Uh, so, uh, I, I expect, I, I know, right? There's all kinds of things. So, um, no, you're asking a legitimate question. And, and what, what, what uh, President-elect Ghani has said is that he would sign the bilateral s security agreement promptly after uh, taking the, uh, after being inaugurated into office. So. Uh, we would anticipate that he'll act uh, promptly on that. He's a man of his word, uh, and uh, I expect he'll keep it. And again, the reason that he'll do that, again, is not uh, as a favor to the United States. It is clearly in the interest of the Afghan people, uh, and it's in the interest of the American people for this agreement to be signed. Uh, and uh, we look forward to uh, his 
signing it uh, so that we can sign it and move forward with this agreement. On India? Okay, one more on Holder. This is another timing thing, but you keep okay. stressing that you expect uh, the Senate to take this up and, and um, to act quickly. And so I'm wondering if speed is such an issue, why the President hasn't yet announced another nominee or didn't, or didn't do it today. Should we take from that that you will make a decision quickly, or that you will make a decision quickly next week? <laughs> uh, well, I don't have any uh, any uh, guidance on the timing to share with you, but um, but this is a this is I, I, I mentioned this yesterday. This is a, a high priority position. We certainly are pleased that Attorney General Holder has indicated a willingness to remain uh, until his successor is confirmed. But um, you know this is a this is a priority. This is something that we um, that my White House colleagues are already hard at work on. Uh, and um, when we have an announcement, I'll definitely let you know. And we would hope that. Uh, members of Congress will act with the same sense of urgency uh, to uh, to confirm uh, Attorney General Holder's replacement. So. All right, Goyal, I'll, the, I, I'll give you one here, and then, then I'm, but only one, and then I'm going to do the yes, weekend. Sir, one, one. Okay. Uh, Josh, in the as far as Prime Minister uh, Narendra Modi's first official visit to U.S. is concerned, in the past many anti-U.S. India elements were. Uh, against uh, uh, the relations between the two countries. Now, same group had a White House petition online against Mr. Modi to mm -hmm. arrest him for his uh, alleged crimes in India. Now, in New York, American Justice Center has filed a lawsuit and judge has ordered su uh, summons against uh, Mr. Modi while he's in uh, New York. So any comments on this and also how it will affect his meetings here in the White House uh, starting from Monday with the President? Yeah. <coughs> uh, let me say two things about that. Uh, the first is, as a general legal principle, let me say that sitting heads of government enjoy immunity uh, from lawsuits in American courts while in the United States. Sitting heads of government also enjoy personal inviability while in the United States, uh, which means they cannot be personally handed or delivered papers to begin the process of a lawsuit. Uh, in addition, as a matter of treaty, the heads of delegations to the UN General Assembly enjoy immunity while in New York to attend uh, UN events. So this means I don't anticipate that it's going to have any impact uh, on his very important visit here to the U.S. and to the White House. Uh, I can tell you that the uh, visit is an opportunity to discuss a range of issues of mutual interest in order to expand and deepen the U.S.-India strategic partnership. It is a partnership that is highly valued uh, by this country and by this White House. Uh, we will discuss ways to accelerate economic growth, bolster security cooperation, and collaborate in activities that bring long-term benefits to both countries and the world. Uh, we'll focus on regional issues, including current developments in Afghanistan, Syria, and Iraq, where India and the United States can work together with partners uh, toward a positive outcome. The President himself uh, looks forward to working with the Prime Minister to fulfill the promise of the U.S.-India strategic partnership for the, for the benefit of citizens in both our countries. Yeah. Yeah. So, I'll do the week ahead, and if you have another one on Monday, maybe we'll give you a chance the day before. Uh, on Monday, uh, the President will attend a DNC event in Washington, D.C. Uh, in the evening, the President will host Prime Minister Narendra Modi of India uh, for a private dinner at the White House. Uh, the Vice President will also attend. Uh, on Tuesday, the President will host Prime Minister Modi of India at the White House. The two leaders, as I mentioned earlier, will discuss a wide range of issues of mutual interest in order to expand and deepen the U.S.-India strategic partnership. On Wednesday, the President will host Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu at the White House. The President looks forward to discussing with the Prime Minister Israel's relations with Palestinians, including the situation in Gaza, developments related to Iran, and the international effort to combat ISIL. Prime Minister Netanyahu's visit is a demonstration of the deep and enduring bonds between the United States and Israel in our close consultations on a range of regional issues the Vice President will participate in those meetings as well. Uh, in the afternoon, the President will welcome Sporting Kansas City to honor their 2013 MLS championship. I'm looking forward to their visit. Uh, in the evening, the President will travel to Chicago, Illinois, where he will spend the night. Uh, we'll have some additional details about the President's travel to Chicago uh, in the next couple of days. Uh, on Thursday, uh, after a couple of events in Chicago, the President will return back here to the White House. That evening, the President will deliver remarks at the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute's annual awards gala at the Walter E. Washington Convention Center. Uh, and then on Friday, the President will participate in a range of meetings here at the White House. So we'll have more details on that Chicago trip, uh, hopefully in the next couple of days. Sure. What do you expect with the Prime Minister? Will there be a full spray or an event? 
press, press her? Uh, I, I haven't gotten the rundown uh, on the visit, but hopefully before the end of the day, we can track that down for you. Okay. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a Is the Chicago visit political or official? Uh, it's my understanding it's a little of both. Uh -huh. uh, so we'll have some more details on that. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Yeah.